Thank you for listening to Mormon Sex Info. This episode is an archived episode and is only now becoming publicly available. Mormon Sex Info relies on contributions. To contribute, please visit mormonsex.info. And now, please enjoy this episode. Welcome to Mormon Sex Info. This is Natasha Helfer Parker. I'm super glad to be here with you today. Just a few quick announcements just to remember that the website is now mormonsex.info. Uh, that's a little bit new, starting as of um, a few months ago. We've been revamping the website and making it more user friendly. Also, just a reminder that any new podcasts are available to subscribers only. And archive podcasts are definitely coming more and more so on Apple iTunes. So it'll get to a point where probably it's only going to be a week or two or three before they're all available on, on iTunes. But having you be subscribers is one way that we can get your financial support to make this podcast um, possible. Because believe it or not, podcasts take money to run and to have a person who edits things and to have people who host uh, material and all of that. So anyway, if you can support this project, I would super appreciate it. It's a $35 suggested donation per year. You can obviously give us more than that. We're not going to complain. You can give us a lot less than that and still feel like you're going to support us. It's fine. If I had every person who listened, just donate a dollar, we would have no problems running this podcast financially. So that would be great as well as that there are other ways to support the podcast as well. You can share the content on social media, tell your friends about it like us on our Mormon Sex Info page, etc. Lots of lots of ways to support this, this project. I always get a lot of positive feedback about it. People tend to like the content and value it. So I want to keep it going. I feel very passionate about this project. Today, I have the great honor to have Shamira Howard with me today. She is a sexologist and just is working towards her ASEC certification, which is one of the ways that I know her is through that organization, which is the American Association for Sex Therapists, Counselors, and Educators. And she is the founder of On the Green Couch, which is her practice, I believe, in Louisiana. Is that right, Shamaria? That is correct. In Louisiana. And she has just written a book called Use Your Mouth, And she also has these cool use your mouth conversation starter cards, which, you know, as she'll talk about more, her whole concept is why are we not using our mouths more to talk about stuff that we should be talking about, especially in the bedroom and dealing with intimacy and all of that. So I'm super excited to have her on. Shamira, say hello. 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 Hey, (laughs) hi. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me on, Natasha. I'm so excited about this conversation. I'm super excited to have you. So um, I would like to just have you introduce yourself a little bit more. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about how you got into this field. Tell us a little bit more about your credentials. Tell you all the things what I've been doing on quarantine. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> so you know different. how you uh might hear people saying stuff like we have communication issues or you hear uh these stories about people in relationships not having sex especially in marriages there are lots of rumors that once people get married they stop having sex um, and then there's other conversations that people have especially like with heterosexual uh women they'll t- talk to each other more than they'll talk to their partner about what they like sexually. Um, And then there's one of my favorites. If we're married, have you ever heard this? Or if we're partnered or if we're together, you should know what I want. Um, Or I don't get... I don't get wet enough. I don't get hard enough. All of that stuff, right? So as a sexologist, as a sex and relationship therapist and a licensed clinical social worker, I heard, I hear, and I've heard all of those stories, and I do have my practice, which is on the green couch, and it is located um, in Louisiana. I have offices in Baton Rouge and in the Prairieville, Gonzalez area, and I help couples manage sexual issues, such as those erection issues. I help them create 
their best relationships and most importantly have whatever they would determine is amazing sex. So those are some of the things I do in my practice. I also am an international speaker. So I travel around the world speaking on all topics, sex and relationships. And I am a number one best-selling author of the Use Your Mouth book, uh, which is on Amazon and the Use Your Mouth Sex and Relationship Conversation starter cards, which we can talk about what the purpose of those cards are in the book a little bit later. So that's just a little bit about what I do. And I, I think I like coffee just a little bit too much. So that's just something personal about me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, so yeah, so I, I, I totally agree with you. Some of the things that most you know, kind of commonly come into my office and I think into most sex therapist's office is the the inability to really know how to have conversations about sexuality. Mm -hmm. So I guess I just like to kind of pick your brain a little bit about why you think that is. What is going on? Why are these conversations so hard to have? Yeah, just what are your thoughts about that? So based on what I see in practice and of course what I hear in these streets, the E streets, <laughs> People um, don't necessarily talk about sex. We are socialized to have sex. And if you have a penis, you're probably more socialized to have sex than those people with a vulva and a vagina. But we um, are a hypersexual culture, but we don't have enough sex education. So depending on how we grew up and how we were raised, the conversations around sex could vary from we never talked about sex. Sex was taboo. It was taught that you don't have sex until you're married. We don't do that. I learned about it in school. So people don't develop the educational tools and the proper uh, behaviors and attitudes and beliefs about sex and sexuality growing up. So when they become older and even married, those same beliefs are perpetuated. So for example, I work with a lot of people who have what we call good girl syndrome. So I grew up in a church, like many people I know and I see, and you were considered to be a good girl if you didn't fornicate or if you didn't have, and I grew up Southern Baptist. So if you didn't have sex before marriage, if you saved yourself for your partner and you, know, you were seen as the good girl and you were the good girl, and a lot of us have that good girl syndrome. So we get into relationships relationships and we get married and those messages still come with us, right? We still carry those messages. So there's no button that you press after once you're married, there's no button to press to say, oh, okay, I'm married. Now I can have sex. Now all of that stuff gets to go away and it just doesn't work like that. So what I think happens is one, we're not given the space to, or the education to talk about sex we, are, we don't have medically accurate information. Our, our sex ed here is subpar. We don't have inclusive sex education. So we just really don't have the language. We don't have, and if you're a person who is a woman, you are probably taught that sex was for, not for you, it's for your partner. So we just don't, a lot of us lack the confidence as well. So there are various reasons why sex isn't talked about in relationships and why, or outside of relationships. And a big one is taboo. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, growing up in the Mormon community and, you know, working with a majority of Mormon people in my practice, I think a lot of these same themes, it's a lot of times sexuality can be presented in a more male centric way. Yeah. Um, a lot of good girl stuff that you're talking about isn't just about not having sex prior to marriage, but it's kind of like what you're saying. We, we don't do that. We don't. So therefore, when you do get married, even though everybody I kind of understands you're going to have sex after marriage, it's not maybe ladylike or spiritual yeah. or nice to talk about sex, to want sex, to be sexy and kind of, you know, more ferocious in your own desire and your own want, because you've been taught to kind of hold that back and to be a gatekeeper of sexuality. And so, and I love the button. I hear that all the time. Where's the button? Where's the button? <laughs> Let me know I can turn these messages off. My brain didn't, you know, our brains and our vaginas and our vulvas and our penises don't know that we're Mormon or Southern Baptist or absolutely not. don't know that you're married. And so they just have these messages that they're still kind of functioning under, even though maybe the context has changed and we want to be more sexual. So I'm just amening a lot of yes. what you're saying. 
Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I think it's across the board, especially with sex therapists and sexologists and sexuality educators as well as across the board. We see and hear a lot of similar stories. And uh, uh, I mean, I don't I think it's it's sad all across the board that people aren't given the information that could possibly uh, change their lives, you know, because sex, a lot of people don't just have sex because it feels good. A lot people have sex for lots of different reasons. And it, it's not just physical. And I talk about that in the book too, that sex isn't just physical. But I think if we were given the opportunity and the platforms and the space to talk about it more and to be to to engage in those types of conversations, we would be more comfortable with it across the board. For example, when I was a kid, we did, I didn't know what a vulva, I never heard of a vulva. I just learned what a vulva was several years ago. Um, and I have one, right? So, uh, but when I was a kid, we, we didn't even say vagina. We called it a, a nunu and it was a, a penis was a wee wee. So even saying stuff like that, it causes some sexual shame. So that's another area that we get into when we're talking about uh, reasons why talking about sex is hard because we're automatically taught that we, we just don't talk about it and we give it names. We don't call an eye a nose. We call a nose a nose and an eye and an eye, but we call a PP, I mean a penis, a PP. We call a vulva and a vagina, a cookie in a pocketbook. What does that say? What type of messages um, do does that send to people with these body parts? And if you're a parent, what message are you sending to your children about their body? I love that. Yeah, it, it really does start with permission. And I think what you're saying is both from a sexual education perspective and also maybe a cultural and family of origin, religious perspectives, we really haven't been given permission to have these conversations. Therefore, we don't know how to have them. Therefore, we're, you know, kind of flailing around in these marriages that we're in sometimes in, in very kind of unnecessarily sad ways, because typically the people I work with love each other. Typically the people I work with want to have a good sex life together typically you know they both have similar goals and their and their wants mm -hmm. and desires for connection and kind of having an enjoyable sex life so why don't we move then into i mean i noticed in your book you're really talking about a variety of intimacies so do you want to talk i mean sometimes in especially in religious cultures the word intimacy mm -hmm. and sex equals the same thing it's the kind of the thing. polite it's the polite way to say sex <laughs> Listen, and, so, and really intimacy is so much more than that. So yeah, go ahead. It's so much more than that. And that's that's one of the main reasons why I wrote this book because as whenever I'm talking to couples, one of the things that I ask them is tell me about the intimacy in your relationship. And they start talking about sex. 90% of the people I ask that question to, they'll say something in regards to sex. But they'll also say, yeah, they'll also say physical intimacy is sex too. And in the book, I differentiate physical intimacy from sexual intimacy because they're not the same. But I also talk about intimacy. Um, I call it conversations because I'm all about conversations. I'm a conversation starter. And so the, the cards came first. And from the cards, I realized that people really wanted more intimacy, but they weren't they didn't have the language to describe it. They would talk about things that they want from their partners or how they would want to share specific moments with their partners. And what they were basically describing is intimacy, being seen, uh, being heard, being understood, being valued. That is what intimacy is. And sex is a part of that, but that is not just sex. And so I talk about seven types of intimacy in this book, from financial intimacy to social intimacy, physical and sexual intimacy as well. And I give different examples and um, I made it really short and to the point, I call it the pocket size book because it's really a pocket size book. And it's uh, just to simply increase seven types of intimacy in and out of the bedroom because what we're noticing and what I've seen and what many couples experience is that, you know, sex doesn't just start in the bedroom. And when we talk about intimacy, we talk about foreplay and we talk about the way that we show up overall in the relationship, all of that plays into what happens in the bedroom as well. So we often hear and there's research that supports that, like if you're helping your partner around the house or if you're speaking a language that your partner um, needs you to speak to them in order to hit the gas, 
on their sexual desire pedal, then you're more likely to have sex. And so what most couples are looking for is just knowing that their partner is basically there for them, that you see me, you hear me, you value me, you understand me, and it's safe for me to be vulnerable enough to express all of these vulnerabilities and to create these different levels of intimacy, which aren't just sex. Agreed. So let's talk about let's talk about this maybe from a more like um, hands-on approach, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say, let's say, you, you know, you have a couple, they come in, they're recognizing, yeah, this is definitely an area that we kind of struggle with. I'm either embarrassed or uneducated or hesitant, you know, vulnerability usually takes a little bit of discomfort <laughs> and, and we like to avoid discomfort, right? We're kind of wired to avoid discomfort. So what are some of the things that you have found helpful to, you know, to just kind of start, start that process in regards to either questions they can be asking themselves or exercises you have them walk through? What are some of your ideas about what to do once you've recognized the problem? Once you recognize, are you asking once you recognize the problem with intimacy or vulnerability? Well, with, with either one of those, right? So, okay, because, they're because very you have, right? they, they're definitely intertwined. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I describe it in the book. So what that, how that plays out for, for me is in the therapy room on the green couch, whenever I'm listening to couples, cause I do a lot of that, right. To get the feel of what's going on. I listen to key things that they say, right. And so based on what they say, that's how I determine what we're going to do. And so I ask them where they want to start based on what I hear. And usually if they agree, they'll say something like, Oh my God, yes, that's what I've been asking for. That's exactly what I need. So I'm trying, I, I have to try to do this given an example and not a real life example, right? So I I like emotional intimacy a lot. I think that that's one of the biggest reasons why couples come in therapy because of the lack of emotional intimacy, which we can see that play off in different forms of other intimacy as well. But whenever you're responding to your partner, how you're fighting, right? So I recognize the, the levels of intimacy work that couples need to work on based on what they're coming in for. So usually I hear we have communication issues, right? And sometimes that means I don't even like my partner. Sometimes that means I don't feel safe enough to tell my partner my fears. I don't feel like my partner's a cheerleader. So wherever that is, we we definitely start there. So we would create a goal with the, what I would help them to create a goal on what they want to achieve. And then that's where we find out that vulnerability is an issue with a lot of people. It's not safe. So if your partner can't come to you with their fears, their complaints, and their victories, and if you can't be their number one cheerleader and also the shoulder that they cry on and pat their back, then we have a huge problem here. We have a huge issue and that falls into some issues with compatibility as well. So what we do is I have couples ask each other specific questions and that's where we come up with the goals. One of the questions that I love asking couples is, of course, how do I show up in a relationship and how can I be a better partner to you? I found out that that question helps couples change a lot in the relationship. Just that one question, how do I show up? And how can I be a better, that one question, how can I be a better partner for you? And then what we do is we make it very specific because I like smart goals. How can I be a better partner for you starting today, this week? What's one thing I could do to be a better partner for you? And so depending on what they say, that's how I determine which level of intimacy we work for. For example, they might say, well, when you come in every day, I would really like to give a get for you to give me a hug every day, or I really like for us to cuddle before we go to bed, right? And so that lets me know that they might want a little bit more social intimacy from their partner, spending more quality time with them, um, 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 more physical intimacy, I'm sorry, spending more quality time, more touch that does not lead to sex because that is another issue. Meaning, so that, I, that, meaning that when they, when touch leads automatically the majority of the time to sex, at least, and you can expound out farther, but what I have found is if that's the pattern they're in, a lot of times they'll actually avoid physical yes. affection because it's like they know they don't want to have sex, even though they would love some physical touch or affection or comfort. And so then they just avoid physical touch altogether. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of people avoid physical uh 
physical touch or physical contact in a relationship for fear that, oh my goodness, the pressure to have sex. And a lot of people avoid, so they're, they're, it goes the other way as well. So for those people who crave the physical touch, right? Um, sometimes their partners will not, or they'll reject giving them the physical touch because they feel rejected as it relates to sexual intimacy because a lot of people associate physical touch and physical intimacy with sexual intimacy. So I, I see that going both ways. And that's why I differentiated in the book physical intimacy from sexual intimacy because they're totally different. And many people would much rather cuddle with you for a longer time without sex there than to cuddle with you with the expectation that, oh my God, I have to have sex with this person. Not because they don't want to or they don't have the sexual desire, but just because sometimes it feels good just to get a hug with, and it just be a hug or just to get a massage and it just be a massage. So that's intimacy as well. Like we, how do you exist in a space with your partner in a specific realm that does not necessarily have to venture off into sex? Not that sex isn't great and good, but sometimes what the space that you're in without sex is way, way, way more comfortable and it's way more intimate than let's just move straight to sex, which also makes the sex even better. It makes your partner feel more connected to you when they know that they can engage with you in that in this level of intimacy and it's just this level of intimacy. Yeah, and I, I completely second that. I often talk about, you know, physical intimacy. Well, I, I say it a slightly different way. Physical intimacy includes sexual and non-sexual touch, right? Which is pretty much exactly what you're saying. And so, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I, and I think one thing that we might want to just talk about briefly is that, especially because you're, you're talking about all these different intimacies and how they all interrelate and how they all kind of interweave into you know, having, for example, a good sex life or mm -hmm. like, for example, you can have a pretty strong emotional intimacy, but not necessarily a strong financial intimacy. Uh. And depending on issues on that depends on whether or not you have a good sex intimacy, right? Sexual intimacy. So all of these are kind of, you can have some and not others. You can have others mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. some, some affect others and some don't depending on the couple, right? So it's all kind yes. of a big stew of interesting <laughs> Yes. Possibilities. Yes. But I guess one thing that I notice a lot is that it tends to be that in a, in a couple, oftentimes one person is le leans towards sexual intimacy, feeling very important in order to like, in order to be able to have the other, intimacy. other types of intimacy. other people lean towards emotional intimacy being very important in order to have the other intimacies, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe one of the other ones, but those seem to be to me anyway, the biggest complaints that come into a sex therapy office. It's like, well, he just, you know, he just wants he to just have wants sex. sex. Yeah. He just wants sex. And, uh, or, you know, she just, she just wants to talk, but she doesn't want to ever touch sex. Me, right. Or, yeah. or, you know, and, 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 and I use the stereotypical genders there, but, but it can show up the other way around too, Absolutely. You know, where, where a female uh, partner can be more about the physical touch and needing that to feel that emotional connection. So, mm -hmm. What what are your thoughts about just talking to couples about how, first of all, all of these intimacies are important. Mm -hmm. And secondly, you may lean a different way than your partner does and have even considered that instead of having these meanings like you just want this. Maybe it's not, maybe it's 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 a legitimate bid for connection. It just yes. differs a little bit from your bids of connection. Absolutely. And we do, we, sh we, we have different uh, bids for connection and that goes hand in hand with desire. But as it relates to intimacy, right? Um, we, have, we want different types of intimacy and that's okay. The purpose of me writing this book is to, be, is to help couples be aware of the different forms of intimacy so that you'll know what you're asking for. You'll have better terminology to ask and you'll be able to assess as where you are at each point in the relationship. And that way you'll have more language to discuss your needs with your partners. Because one, I might want the emotional intimacy. You might say I'm a bad spender. So, and that might be getting in the way of our bedroom because if you're sitting over here struggling at nighttime because you're putting a budget together and you're noticing that I'm buying way too much coffee. I'm buying like triple espressos, iced espressos, three times a day, Monday through Thursday, and that's causing us to have an extra $200 coming out the account a month, 
this may or may not be real, by the way, then, <laughs> then you probably don't want to have sex with me. You want, you want to know that I will do better in the spending department, but financial intimacy is, is a big taboo as well, because some of us have issues with money, like the same way we have issues talking about sex. Some of us have issues talking about money in the relationship. So we're preoccupied with what's happening in other areas. And so the way I like to help couples determine what your intimacy needs are is to have what I call intimacy appraisal. And so I put that in the book as well. Um, you go through the book, which is, again, it's a really short book. You go through the book and you discuss these different forms of intimacy. You ask each other these questions that are at the end of the each conversation. And then there's an intimacy appraisal. And so basically the intimacy appraisal is for couples to assess where they are at different levels of intimacy. So you'll know what your partner needs from you at any given time, and you'll be able to tell them what your intimacy needs are. So what I recommend is to start off with doing these intimacy appraisals once a week. So you're basically checking in with each other, asking once a week. And I, and I think I just put maybe a few questions, five questions that you would ask a week to each other, and you'd be able to talk about it and ask your partner partner where they are, what their intimacy needs are, what they need from you now. Because what I need from you this week might not be what I needed last week or yesterday. So I think that's important. So you will start off by doing these every week. And then I think we start doing them quarterly, like every three months, once you recognize that, okay, we are really now we're understanding each other's bids for connection and attention and intimacy. I know I have a better grasp on what my partner needs from me. They have a better grasp on what I need, but we do know that we evolve in relationships. So it's important to continue to check up on the intimacy. You wanna continue, if I always tell people, if you want anything to appreciate, you gotta appraise it. You see what the value is and see if it's going up or down. So you make sure that you're doing these intimacy appraisals so that you'll know where your intimacy value is going up or down. One of the things that couples often do in a relationship is should on each other. And I find that too, you should know, well, we've been married for 20 years, 15 years. We've been married for two days. You should know what I like. Nah. It doesn't work like that all the time. Your partner isn't a mind reader and we change. So it's our responsibility to definitely pay attention to our partners. That's a big part of the emotional intimacy, but it's also our responsibility to use your mouth, use our mouth and tell our partners what our needs are, what we're feeling, and to be able to receive that emotional response and safety from our partners. Awesome. So given that this is Mormon sex info and we're kind of heading towards the back end of our interview, I would really like to spend some time focusing on some very direct, very kind of just either, you know, kind of like you started off with some of the language like penis, vagina, vulva, you know, am I hard? Am I wet? Those are things that oftentimes have a, a bit of a different feel than how are you feeling today? Like, how are you feeling today is still a question many of us struggle with and need to be able to ask, but I'd like to focus the end of our interview on conversations and things that you think people are having a hard time talking about in regards to their very specific sexual desires, needs, wants, touch, bodies, et cetera. What do you, what do you see as some of the, the things that people are not talking about? People are not talking about a lot and, mo and uh, specifically, um, I think a reason why is because a lot of people don't know what they want. So if we have been in these situations to where we've not had the permission, as you just stated earlier, to be confident or to be expressive about our sexualities, we might not know what we want. We might know what we don't want. I find that we often know what we do not want, but oftentimes we don't really know what we want. And so having the space to explore with our partners is, su is super important, which again, sometimes that doesn't happen. Being able to talk to your partners at your partner and having the space to explore with them so that you can know what you like and how, but also having the courage to explore your own body, regardless if you have a vulva or a penis, to explore your own body, ask questions, right? Ask your partner questions. Um, it's uncomfortable. People are not really comfortable saying, hey, I really like when you lick my nipples when you're stimulating me, or I really like when you grab my butt when you're uh, when we're having sex, because it's taboo, like it's 
can I say this? Sometimes people don't even want to moan and they want to, but they don't want to do it because it's not something that we don't do that, right? The guy can scream and moan and do all his stuff, but a lot of times women are like, ah, I'm gonna hold back a little bit or they'll even fake it, which we don't want to do that. So that's why I created these. These are the use your mouth sex and relationship conversation starter cards, which it loosens up the conversations around sex and relationships. It allows you to talk about it in a fun way. So if you're not a person who wants to be more direct with, hey, you know, tell me how you like oral sex, you could use these cards because you take turns asking each other different questions and there are different questions as it relates to relationship and sex. So there might be questions like, you know, how do you like to feel before sex? Answering that question can give you a lot of information about your partner because people like to feel different ways before sex. Some people need to feel relaxed. Some people want to feel subdued. Some people want to feel um, warm. Some people like to feel cool. So that gives you a lot of information uh, for your partner. How do you like to feel after sex? And so this is a big, uh, big question too because sometimes one of the biggest things that sexual intimacy is missing is aftercare. And aftercare is, I am, uh, I specialize in BDSM as well, but, and that's something that we talk about a lot in that community, but aftercare is super important for whenever we are having some type of sexual intimacy with our partners, whether that we are going to get each other some warm tea or a warm towel or whatever, cuddling for five minutes, showing your partner some care afterwards can determine what happens at the next time, at the next sexual um, experience that we enjoy. There are also other questions like, um, what are some fantasies that you might have? Or what, there are some that might say what turns you on maybe, but also one of my favorite questions in this deck is what is your best sexual experience even or describe your best sexual experience even if it hasn't happened yet that's one of my favorite cards but that's also a card where a couple struggle with because it's a fantasy right and if I tell my partner this part of me will they reject me or what will they think of me and I find that that's another issue another barrier in talking about sex is the courage to be vulnerable because you don't want to be rejected or you don't want your partner to look at you in a different way. But these cars are a fun way to talk about some of those tough conversations around sex and relationship. Another favorite, what's the best, what's the best, uh, what's your favorite and least favorite thing about being in a relationship? Those, that's great information to get from your partner. So these are my favorite. I'm not saying it because I made it, <laughs> but I'm saying it because so I've gotten lots of feedback from it, but they also facilitate super important conversations that couples are not having. I met a person who told me they've been married to their partner for 20 years and they had not ever talked about most of this, the things that they see in the questions and the questions are super simple. Like they're, they're simple questions. Like, but we just, these aren't things that we talk about every day. And you can definitely see a change in your relationship and it'll cause you to have more cup. The, the reason why I like these is because one question can create an hour long conversation and you can get things done and then you can show up differently for your partner. I love that. What, what would you say? I mean, I, I totally <laughs> second your suggestion, but why is faking orgasm? Why is using your mouth to lie? Not such a great idea. Well, it, what that does is it sends messages that one, your pleasure isn't as important as your partner's. And so as, as people who have been conditioned to be ashamed of their pleasure, to not be forthcoming with asking for pleasure, to not acknowledge their own pleasure, it does, it doesn't send a great message. And if you want your sexual intimacy or your sexual experience to be collaborative with your partner, you need to be making sure that there are mutual ways that you're creating space to uh, meet each other's sexual needs. And faking orgasms is not going to do that. And what that causes is sometimes even more resentment. And that also causes people to go out and get their needs met elsewhere. It you you don't you're not as uh, close or comfortable with your body as you probably can be by faking orgasms. And it also makes your part, it doesn't give your partner information, right? The information they need rather, because if you're faking orgasms, your partner probably thinks that they're doing everything that they need to do. And you're holding resentment 
towards your partner for something that you've not even expressed to them is a problem. I don't orgasm. But orgasm isn't necessarily your partner's responsibility. I tell every person, your orgasm is your own responsibility. And that means that you are responsible for knowing how your body works. You need to get in there and mess around and touch and play and see if I touch this, this happens. If I rub here, this happens so that you can advocate for yourself. You can use your mouth with your partner to let them know, hey, if you touch me right here, that'll probably turn me on more. And when you know that you are going to get something uh, that you like out of it, you're more prone to want to do it. But also you don't want to send a message to your partner that you're liking it and you don't, because that's kind of, that's kind of not the reason why we have sex, right? We want to have it because we like it. Although orgasm is not the be all end all of sex, the total sexual experience is super important. But if orgasm is important to you, and if you want to experience orgasm, then faking it is not okay. You do not want to diminish your pleasure. You do not want to send your partner messages that they are doing what they think they're doing when they're not. Because later on, if this conversation comes up, that might be a problem. Like, well, why didn't you say anything? Yeah, yeah. I, I, so there's several things that you're saying that I want to hit on. Um, one is that, yeah, how, how is your partner supposed to know if, if you don't, if you're not honest? And secondly, I, I see this as kind of like a fragility issue on both sides. It's yeah. like, if I can't be honest about showing up or ask a question or be curious or take feedback, right? Because sometimes you know, the feedback that comes at you isn't always going to be unicorns and rainbows either. Like if somebody says, actually, I do want this to change, or I do want you to touch me a different way, or I do need a different type of, you know, when I am um, initiation, right. Or things like that, that can be a little like, oh, I need to be resilient enough to be able to take that feedback. So I see it as an issue of fragility, either in what you were saying, I'm afraid to share because you're going to think of me differently. Yes. Therefore, I'm dealing with an insecurity and, or I'm afraid to share with you because I feel like you're going to be offended or I'm going to hurt your feelings, which means I'm now worried about your fragility, right? So it tends to be kind of this fragility issue in regards to we're so worried about offending each other or hurting each other that then we can't show up, which I call it, and I call this protective intimacy, which is like fat faux intimacy. It's a counterfeit intimacy. We think that we're being loving and caring by protecting feelings instead of really showing up and being honest with our partners, which then in reality is true intimacy. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I want you to talk about that because I love that. <laughs> Tell me about the full intimacy. But I, I agree, right? You, you're right. That does get in the way of true intimacy. And I think we do that, of course, because we are conditioned that our roles in relationship are to like boost our partners up and we're supposed to please our partners and mm-hmm. hey I'm supposed to, if I'm supposed to be your biggest cheerleader I'm gonna fake it right mm-hmm. so if no but that's the full intimacy in which gets in the way of true intimacy and if we are truly experiencing the emotion intimacy as I talk about in the use your mouth book then I think that full intimacy will definitely be something that will dismiss because you get to show up authentically because then you learn what true vulnerability is and that is the that's the real issue that's why this full intimacy as you named it that I love trademark that that's why <laughs> this shows up because the vulnerability there right it's I'm afraid, you know, I'm scared. I don't, I don't, I don't think we have the basis covered enough in this area for me to feel courageous enough to come out and say this or to accept this. Therefore, I'm going to put up this mask and I'm going to say that all is well in the kingdom when it really isn't. And again, like you said, that gets in the way of true intimacy because now we're having a relationship that's not even our relationship because we're, we're not being truthful. We're not being honest. And that's when the resentment starts set, set, setting in. And that's, I think that is also a precursor to we have communication problems. Mm-hmm. Well, you'll definitely have communication problems if you're not being upfront and true about what your feelings are. So definitely you are having communication problems. Yeah, no, I, I, I really appreciate that. And I think that, so you mentioned several times 
Well, before I go there, one thing I was just going to say, since we both come from religious backgrounds, is that I think some of this protective intimacy is inappropriately taught to us. We are taught to be kind, to be loving, to not hurt other people. When you think about how marriage is talked about, it's oftentimes, you know, love your spouse, don't offend your partner, be there, be there, help me. You know, we have these kinds <laughs> of languages. So Mm -hmm. it's like, if I really show up with my sexuality in a way that I know might bother you or might rub it up against your, not do that, I better be the loving, kind spouse, but then we run into these kinds of problems. So that's just what I wanted to mention. Oh yeah, I like that you mentioned that because that does come up. You know, our, our religious backgrounds get in the way sometimes of the way we show up. And I think sometimes we could, we uh, could misinterpret some of the, what that means as well and it shows up in the way that we interpret it or in the way that it's taught to us I, I this is probably an edgy comment but I all I've asked people how to tell me like in you know with your religion and your uh the, the religion that you follow what does it say about how you treat yourself and so you know how many messages do we get about how we treat others we have an abundance, right? How often do we get those same messages about how are you treating yourself, right? And so I think that plays a lot into it as well, because as you just mentioned, so much focus is put on how we're showing up for other people that we are probably, we probably feel compelled to, we feel responsible for making sure other people feel well. And then that causes us to become people pleasers and that causes codependency issues and that causes a whole bunch of issues. So that's a whole other conversation, but I like the way, I like that you brought that up because it's very um, relative to this discussion. Yeah. And you mentioned on several, on two occasions now that I can think of the importance, and if you're going to communicate it's important to know what you want. And so you're making references to knowing your body, which then of course is reference to masturbation or self-touch or something along those lines, which can be a touchy topic for, especially with people with more conservative religious values. Oh, so yeah. People I know in Mormonism, there's, it's kind of like a mixed bag. There are, you know, I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of not thousands at this point of Mormon couples. And I'll ask, you know, is there room for self-touch? And there's Mormon couples that would be like, no, masturbation is a sin. And that's not something that we're comfortable with at all. And then I have other Mormon couples that are like, absolutely. We love it. We, we think it's great. Um, it's been super helpful in helping us know ourselves, et cetera. So is there any thought that you have as far as how to, how to, how to deal with that complexity when people aren't comfortable with self-touch or see mm-hmm. masturbation as something quote unquote mm-hmm. simple in regards to this uh, very helpful advice that knowing yes. yourself can actually be very conducive to coupled sexuality. Yes. So you're right. And you know, even people in Baptist and other religions have problems with masturbation and this scripture that's always taken out of context about spilling the seed always comes up when we're talking about masturbation. And so we're like, that's not what, the, you know, it's, that doesn't mean that. that that isn't in reference to masturbation, but that's a whole other conversation. So you, I think it, it's a matter of education on, you know, sex education as well. It's a, a matter of what you feel comfortable with. Some people feel more comfortable with exploring their body with a partner than they do by themselves. And so I call that mutual masturbation. Sometimes it's mutual masturbation. It's it's a form of sex. Or some people feel comfortable masturbating in the presence of their partner, which probably less people feel comfortable doing that than than not. But some people feel comfortable or most comfortable uh, with their partner being involved in some way. And I like to talk to people first about like, I like to bust a lot of myths with people. So I tell people to go back. I remember I had this conversation with a, a Jew, com- a Jewish community. And we talked about this too, like masturbation and, you know, how that's not okay. And so we talked about going back and talking to your rabbis and talking to, you know, you talk to your religious leaders if you need to, but also create your own sexual boundaries for yourself. So what you feel good with the boundaries that you feel honor you and that you feel honor your your religious values as well and you and your partner's relationship so if you feel comfortable exploring your body with your partner do that um if you feel comfortable doing it by yourself and it doesn't 
um, cross over your other values or boundaries, I'd say do that as well. But I would say no one knows you or no one is going to know you more than or better than you know yourself. So you can't, can't tickle yourself, but you can definitely touch yourself and you can make yourself orgasm. And that's not for everybody. And I would say if it's not your thing, then and it's not your thing, but understand why it's not your thing, right? Ask yourself, why isn't this my thing? Is it not my thing? Because I was told that it was bad or it was sinful. Um, I also like to tell people to, it depends on what Bible you are in, you know, your body was created for you by your creator. So your creator already know, or already knew what your body was capable of doing when you were presented in this body in this way. So people with clitorises, you have a clitoris, <laughs> you know, I can't get any more specific than saying that your clitoris, uh, even though there's new research that uh, links clitoris to some type of reproduction, reproductive function as well, but people with clitorises use those, there's no other way to orgasm except by way of the clitoris. Now, some people say, and I'm talking about with vulva vaginal orgasm, some people say that they have vaginal orgasms, but the way the clitoris is set up, your clitoris is still involved. And you would know that if you understood it a little bit more. So even if you won't touch yourself, read up about it, read what other people are saying about it. And maybe you will be inspired to do something that serves you and that serves your pleasure, but also think of different types of pleasure because touching yourself isn't the only way that you can get pleasure. Ask your partner to do it, guide their hand, right? If you don't wanna use your own hand, take your partner's hand and guide their hand and use their hand or put the toy in their hand. Yes, I said toy. Put the toy ah, in their ah, hand, right? I love it. I know that's a whole other thing, right? Put the toy in their hand and guide their hand there and, you know, use them if you don't want to feel, if you don't want to do it yourself. But don't do yourself a disservice by not exploring what sex could be like for you. Do you feel like that's another whole issue that the couple struggle with is, is talking about sex toys? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. What, so what, there are so many reasons why. So about that. yeah, well, what I hear is that one, some people, you know, we have to, of course, we have to dismiss the myths. Um, toys and masturbation isn't a substitute for a partner or for partner sex. And so some people are like, well, if I have a partner, I don't need to masturbate and I don't need to use a toy. And if you use a toy, it's going to desensitize you. And uh, I I have the penis. I don't want another penis in the relationship. And it's like, uh, so toys can only enhance your sexual relationship. They're not meant to compete with the person in your relationship. Some people, you got to understand what a vulva is and what a clitoris is. And you got to understand that people evolve us, 80% of them need clitoral stimulation in order to orgasm, more than 80%. And you got to understand that there's an orgasm gap. And this is researched information. And an orgasm gap exists for a reason. So we are finding that people in heterosexual relationships, so men who are married to women are orgasming more than 98% of the time, while their partner, who is a woman, is orgasming maybe less than 70% of the time. That's a huge problem. And so if we were to look at why that happens, a lot of times it's because we are not touching ourselves. We don't know what brings us pleasure. We're not masturbating. We're afraid to use toys. And also we're not understanding the clitoris, right? The clitoris is the, the way to orgasm. So for a lot of people, they need direct clitoral stimulation. So what that means is they need constant pressure on the clitoris. And I didn't bring my clitoris. I usually have it right here <laughs> um, with me, but it's in the other room. And so they need constant pressure on the clitoris and in order for them to orgasm. And some women need toys or vibrators in order to do that. And that's okay, that needs to be okay. That is another way for people to be revolutionary about their pleasure, their sexual pleasure and their orgasms. I love it. And to not be threatened by those things. No. I, I love the word that you used, enhance. You know, mm -hmm. I think sometimes We've all, for whatever reason, well, mostly I think it's because just it's a reproductive function and that's about the only type of sexuality historically we've been comfortable yeah. with, <laughs> but yeah. we are, we are comfortable with kind of like missionary style, you know, woman on her back, man on top type of sexual encounter. Well, why are we so comfortable with that when actually that type of encounter can be extreme if that person is being uh, sexually assaulted in some way, raped or taken, you know, there's exploitation. 
that encounter is not in of itself good or bad. It's the context okay. that creates whether or not that encounter, that missionary style position, sex that's happening in that moment is enhancing the relationship or not. Absolutely. Right? If you're in the middle Absolutely. of duty sex, if you're in the middle of you know, coerced sex, um, you can be in a very kind of vanilla-esque situation that is not healthy for your relationship. And then Absolutely. we think these things like sex toys or BDSM or masturbation and, and oh, those are naughty. Those are bad. And yet those things can be very enhancing for people's relationships, for people's marriages. It can help increase passion, increase fun, increase stimulation, and, you know, decrease the orgasm gap like you're talking about um, and actually enhance your marriage and your couplehood. They can also be destructive. They can also be used destructively. Just like anything. Sexual. Anything. Yes, anything. And so again, you mentioned context and that's what's super important. It's the context and you can't be intimidated by a toy. And for the people who say, won't they desensitize you? It's not that they desensitize you, right? Those are muscles. It's not that your muscles are being desensitized, but just think about it. If if you did the same exercise, let's say you just lift the weights and you just did 10 sets of 10 every day, right? And one day you're going to be able to do 10 sets of 10. You're not going to feel anything. It's not going to have any effect on your muscles. You're not going to have any gains because there's no variety there. So your body, whenever you're exercising, your body needs variety in order for you to see some change in your in the way the exercise um works on your body the same way happens with the way you say the, the way you orgasm the way you masturbate if you're orgasming and masturbating using the same technique your body is likely going to get used to the friction uh get used to what's happening during that moment and that's what happens your body becomes used to that routine so you just need to switch up the routine it's not that you become desensitized and you no longer are able to orgasm ever again in life it's just that if you keep rubbing your penis on your leg, you go and that's the way you orgasm. If you're having penis and vagina penetrator style sex, you're probably less likely to orgasm because a vagina feels so much different than a leg. And also a, a penis feels so much different from a, a vibrator. So you just have to have some variety and switch it up. And that's the great thing about sexual intimacy because it's not just penetrative sex. It includes a lot of different things. I love it. Well, I know that you have a schedule and you have to get going. I love your double entendre. Use your mouth because of yes. course our mouth is a wonderful sexual tool. It can be used in lots of wonderful ways. Yes. Uh, kissing, oral sex, uh, snuggling, you know, kissing all over the body, kissing in the mouth, all the just beautiful yes. ways that you can use your mouth. Breathing on a vulva, talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then, yeah, but then this idea of use your mouth to communicate is a beautiful message that you're sending out through your product. So I just, I want to give you just a chance for final thoughts, or is there something maybe I didn't bring up that you were dying to bring up or talk about and kind of lead us out here? <laughs> well, I definitely appreciate this conversation. I wish that we could have these every day all over the world for people because people have questions. People want their situations to be normalized. They want some answers. People want to hug and kiss and get massages and then not lead to sex. People want to know how to talk about sex without feeling awkward or weird or offending their partner. They want to know how can I decline sex? How do I initiate sex? And how do I deal with the rejection? And so I think these conversations are super helpful to help people deal with that stuff. And if you can't have these conversations, I always recommend people to go to sex therapy. I think sex therapists are saving the world, couple, uh, couple after couple, session after session, individual after individual, because it's not just about sex, right? It's called sex therapy encompasses a lot. And so I recommend people, if you are having some difficulty in your sexual relationships or in your relationship, or that you think might lead to some difficulty in your relationship. If you're not sure about orgasm, if you're not sure if this is supposed to feel like that, if you're having some pain even during sex and it's not pleasurable, pleasurable for you, or if you're afraid, uh, get in touch with a sex therapist in your area. You can use a Google search. Natasha is my sex sexuality, uh, sex therapy supervisor. She's great. Get in touch with her. She can link you well-connected 
uh, in these sex therapy streets, she can definitely link you. You can even contact me. I'm re very great about getting people resources and connecting them to people. My website is on thegreencouch.com, just a green couch. And I do have a green couch in my office. So you can go to onthegreencouch.com. You can reach out to me by email or you can see me here on social media, um, Facebook. I'm sexologist Shamira and I'm also sexologist Shamira on Instagram. I talk back. I don't bite and I'm not going to make you do anything you don't want to do. I appreciate this conversation. I love that. That's so awesome. Um, I love that you said I talk. I don't bite back. That's so cute. <laughs> Well, oh, that's awesome. I, I, I so appreciate your time I, and your energy. I'm glad you shared your um, ways to reach you because I was going to ask you that next. I'll make sure and link to everything that you're offering so, so people can know how to buy your products, which I think are super fun and helpful. And also um, just, you know, if they're interested in seeing you professionally or reaching out to you for further resources, that's great. So thank, thank you, you so Samira, much. for being You're on. You're welcome. And thank for those you. of you who are listening, I hope that you found value in this conversation. Again, please go to mormonsex.info if you want to leave a donation, which is a great way to support us. Feel free to share our podcast with, you know, within your social media. And as usual, we just, we just are here to help you have a, a closer and more authentic and integrated um, approach to your sexuality, both as an individual and hopefully in your coupled relationships, if you happen to be in one. So thank you so much for your time and we'll see you all next time. Thanks. Goodbye. <laughs>
tortured by my dying till the day I die. And into the beyond, it's as simple as our love is. That's how I wanna go.